Is that it? Yes, perfect. That's fine. All right. Uh, so today, Vlad will present um, his latest publication that he did in the lab. So it will be more technically oriented toward that kind of scientific contribution. I know Vlad since 2013. I had to check it out. Uh, he was doing an internship as a master student when I was in, in Zurich. And uh, we worked together since since there. Uh, we even tested robots uh, for Italian firefighters together. And uh, Vlad was part of two EU projects uh, on search and rescue. So that is typically his skill, uh, skill set. He's working in the lab since two years. Um, is the initiator of our part inter international participation to the DARPA Subterranean Challenge, and is also the scientific lead on our research program for SNOW. Uh, that research program is where we test and investigate and develop an autonomous navigation in winter conditions. Uh, so within that context, uh, I will let him talk about the, his later, latest paper. And up to you, Vlad. Okay, thanks for the introduction. I will share my screen in my presentation. As I practiced yesterday, screen is shared. And it's going to full screen. I need to turn on my laser pointer. Um, is it all right? Okay. So thank you, thank you for attending this presentation. Um, we've been working on an interesting topic uh, of applying and using global satellite navigation in difficult environments together with our master students, Philip and Philip. And I will show you uh, what we have come up to until now. As Francois said, uh, I'm a in his office, in his laboratory, normal. And generally what we do, is that, that we take uh, uh, mobile robots, we throw them into uh, difficult environments, into snow, into forests, and uh, we wait and see what breaks. And when something breaks, either hardware or software, we, think, we try to figure out why it broke. And while doing that, we usually learn something new. And it sometimes lead to, sometimes it leads to, uh, interesting papers. Like in this case, uh, when we tried to see if we can uh, predict whether any of your prefer preferred uh, global navigation systems such as uh, GPS or uh, Galileo or GLONASS, something else, will actually work in an environment that you choose for your robots. Um, it might be autonomous car, it might be autonomous robot somewhere in the forest, or maybe a boat. So, I guess you know that, uh, and now I will, this is GNSS, this Global Navigation Satellite System. I will call it GPS from now on, because it's more, more easy, but you can imagine any other system. So I guess you know that your GPS will be working fine somewhere in some open area, like, uh, uh, for, uh, like a desert, or maybe, see and perhaps a very large parking lot in front of Walmart. But in, uh, in a city or in a forest under trees, you know, you know it's not so good. Uh, and that's because uh, the signals that come from satellites uh, don't always go directly into your GPS receiver. They sometimes get uh, blocked by obstacles like buildings, rocks and they also might go through vegetation. There are also some other effects, but in our work, we focus on these two main problems. Now, how it looks really in practice when we really try to use GPS. This is an experiment uh, that we did. Let's say you want to take the robot like this and pass through some open area, and then through a forest. And you just record uh, the position as reported by your GPS receiver. This is the result, uh, what you get from a one GPS uh, receiver. Uh, you can see that the, the trajectory is quite fuzzy and this is definitely not what uh, we were driving. 
this in this experiment. You are uh, navigating the robot in straight lines, but uh, here close to the building, here around the library, and also in the forest, uh, the localization error is quite hard. Uh, five or six meters uh, localization error is not an exception. It's maybe a, or maybe a rule. So if you just want to record the position and put it into a map, that's fine. You just end up with uh, something like this and you get annoyed and you have to repeat it maybe later with some other solution. The problem comes when you try to uh, use it to navigate the robot or control it autonomously. Of course, uh, if such data go into a robot controller, you end up with the robot hitting the wall or a tree, or maybe uh, it will fall into a lake. So in that case, you can try to uh, get it better. One approach to this is to use uh, additional source of corrections. It works like uh, that you use a static, another GPS receiver, which uh, is stationary somewhere and just listening to the satellite signals. And the fact that it's not moving helps you to correct your own localization. The limitation here that is that you need to be able to transmit in real time the information from the static antenna to your mobile, to your mobile robot. And uh, this link is somehow uh, the weakest, weakest thing in your, in your navigation. If this link breaks, for example, if you're too far from your reference antenna, then you revert back to the to that ugly GPS that you, see, that you saw before. Now, we are not the only ones who look at this problematic. In uh, the state of the art, there are two big groups of papers. One of them uh, uses uh, 3D representation of the environment. It's usually urban environment and the models, they come from uh, Google or maps, or maybe open, open street maps. And these approaches, they can tell you which satellites on the sky might get blocked by the, by the buildings. And even some of these satellites, uh, the signals from them can come to you by bouncing off some buildings. And these approaches can tell you that this satellite, you are not supposed to uh, receive signal from, but uh, you are receiving it, so it means it bounced and they correct the organization. The other big group of publications uh, is uh, focused on forests, and they look on the composition of trees, vegetation, uh, the density of the vegetation, and based on that, they, uh, they try to predict if your GPS is going to be good at that part of forest or not. So what we do, we try to combine t these two worlds into one solution, <clears throat> which tries to predict how many satellites you are going to be able to use uh, based on a map and some representation of the environment in our case, because this is our specialty in the lab uh, based on 3D point clouds. They are captured by laser range riders. And on a known constellation of satellites. This is fortunately for free. Uh, this, all the systems transmit this information to you. And you can also download uh, constellations, with, like future constellations for a few days with high precision from the internet. And finally, we try to combine these things and try to estimate uh, is it going to be good or bad uh, to use GPS at that given spot, get that given date in your environment. And the motivation, as I've suggested, might be that you want to be able to plan uh, trajectories. And uh, this work is something similar for uh, planning uh, robot trajectories such that it never gets too far from an access point. They don't want to lose the contact uh, with the network, so they plan to go through them. In our case, it would be similar. We just want to plan trajectories which don't go through uh, portions of the environment, which has a uh, bad GPS reception because we know that we get into trouble there. So now, how we do it? We start with the point cloud, uh, with a 3D representation of the environment. And this is an example. 
Uh, on the left, uh, you see one building in our university campus. It's taken. This is taken from uh, Google uh, Google Earth, just to visualize what you're looking at. On the right side, uh, this is um, a 3D point cloud taken by a robot which uh, followed the, the red line. So we get a map like this. Just to explain, what you see here is uh, this portion here. Those are the windows and walls in the in the yard of that uh, building. And this black uh, planary structures, that's the ceiling of the ground floor. The robot could go under, so all these are the ceilings that the robot saw from beneath. Once more, to give you an idea of the 3D shape. So now we have a point cloud, and uh, since in our approach we want to distinguish between vegetation, that would be the forest case, and between solid obstacles, that's more like the city case, we need to be able to tell which portions of the point cloud are uh, rather vegetation, which are solid obstacles. Our approach is to look on local geometry in the point cloud to see uh, if the local gem local shapes are more like uh, planes, planar surfaces, which for us indicate uh, solid structures, because man-made structures are usually flat, and this also holds for rocks and things like that. On the other hand, uh, vegetation usually uh, looks like a uniform distribution of points in space when taken by a laser rangefinder. It's because of the leaves and small branches you will get a bunch of points which are uh, distributed uniformly. And now, uh, how we actually do this? Uh, we go through the whole point cloud, and for every point, we take its close neighbors, let's say 20 closest points, and we look on the shape these points uh, form together. If it's uh, more towards, uh, okay, how to take, how to tell what shape it is, is by taking the uh, covariance matrix of the distribution of these points and the uh, eigen numbers of uh, this covariance matrix indicate the shape. Uh, we define uh, two functions, spherical function u and planar function s. These two functions uh, just consist of comparing the sizes, sizes of the eigenvalues and uh, they have the property then when the shape of the points goes towards a spherical uniform distribution, the function u gets closer to one. If it's more like plane, the function s goes towards one. Um, we combine these two functions just by subtracting them to get this uh, classificator, classi classifying functions, function which uh, for points which are close to planary surfaces or resemble planes, the function goes towards minus one, and then the same function goes towards plus one if it's more like a spherical uniform distribution. In this point cloud, the red points are those points classified as planes. You can see that the, all these red points on the ground and on the ceilings on the building and on the walls, those all would be classified as planes. On the other side of the spectrum, the points uh, here on the trees, uh, they are all classified as, uh, as vegetation or uh, uniform distribution points, but we understand it as, as vegetation. Uh, and the function actually goes smoothly from minus one to one. So all in between, and it's usually uh, branches on the walls or these columns and maybe lamp posts, they lie somewhere around zero. So this way, we are able to tell whether the points belong to trees or uh, solid objects. Now, what to do with that? Uh, in the next slides, I will be showing two examples uh, a spot in the map taken close to trees, and then another one taken close to the building. And there will be a such a sequence of uh, 
views that you see here on the overview. This is a pipeline, how we start with uh, point cloud and a known constellation, and we end up with the result, which is the sky view with expected uh, satellite coverage. So first block, the first image is just a view from camera. Next to it, you have a similar view, but with a point cloud. So these trees, they come up like points. And uh, in our in our plots, if it's green, it's uh, it's the vegetation. And if, if it's brown, it's more towards the solid objects. And we go, we take a, a sky view, put the points that we see from that point from the ground. Uh, to be able to compute something, uh, we need to discretize the sky view into some finite bins. And for each bin in this uh, sky view, we know what type of points there are and how many. Further, to uh, be able to find the areas of the sky view which are not blocked at all, we do this simple mask. And the idea is that if there are no points or it's just like one, two, some noise, uh, we know that in these portions of the sky, there will be no blocking of the signal at all. We then combine these two masks, the mask which tells us uh, what points there are and what areas are not going to block at all, and we create an attenuation mask. Uh, this tells us the areas that we expect a high attenuation of the signals or complete blocking. What we do next is that we download uh, from the internet or just wait for the satellite to send it the given constellation of satellites as if there were no obstacles in the sky. We combine these two masks and then we get the result. So once more uh, with uh, bigger images, and these are the two ex uh, examples, the top part, there's the vegetation we are standing next to some trees. The uh, bottom part is we are standing uh, in, the, in the inner yard of one of the buildings in the campus looking upwards. So as you would expect, uh, looking on the point cloud from the same spot, we up here we see a lot of vegetation. Down here we see all those points labeled as uh, solid obstacles. This is the uh, discretization step when we split the view into a discrete bins. These portions of the sky are the unobstructed ones. We know that uh, the signal will go through them easily combined uh, with the, the point cloud data, we get the attenuation masks. Uh, you can see that here, up here, with just the vegetation, the attenuation is not so bad. The more dark, the more, uh, more violet, uh, the more attenuated the signal we get. It's much worse here because uh, all of those uh, points indicate fluid structures. So you know you shouldn't pass any radio signals through them. Next one is our two satellite constellations, which were there at the moment we were taking the data. And when we apply the mask from the previous step, we get the result. So here you can see, we see most of the satellites still just slightly attenuated, but in the bottom part, when we are standing under the ceiling, uh, you can see that just the satellites that were on the portion of the view when there were no buildings, they get through. And the rest down here, slightly, but there used to be much more satellites, much uh, more, many. Okay. Um, in this next part of the talk, I will show you how we got to the model and how we verify that uh, the result that we get actually makes sense. We made two data collection platforms. The first one was just the box with the two sensors that we need for our purpose, with the laser rangefinder and the GPS antenna. And this platform was nice. It, it was light and could be um, dragged behind a snowmobile and mounted on a small robot. And we collected some experiments with that in the campus and in the Foray Memorial Sea. And uh, 
one year later, we could use our new robot to carry the sensors around for us. This uh, actually has two antennas, but we are using just one antenna and one uh, like laser, laser range finder as with the previous uh, data collecting platform. The places when we collected the experiments were several, several areas here at the campus. We were interested in the close proximity of buildings. We were interested in the open areas and the vegetation. And in the foreign emergency, uh, the interest was in the pine forests, which are very dense. And it was interesting to see how much signal they actually attenuate. And they actually do quite a lot. And during the experiments, as usual, we learned new interesting things. One is that uh, there is a lot of uh, curious animals in the forest, and especially this, these, these birds which tend to land and sit on your GPS antennas. You can imagine when you need to collect your reference data for the paper, there is a bird sitting on the antenna. Uh, it's not so good. So during the experiments, uh, actually I had to stand there as a scarecrow, uh, making sure that uh, there are no birds on the, on the equipment. Another thing that we found out uh, was that uh, even if you have several, several GPS antennas, and you have that the better RPK corrected uh, localization. In the case that your moving antenna is uh, in an area when there, there are like two or maybe four satellites uh, available, the RPK will not save you. Uh, even this better solution will not provide any reasonable uh, data, which is sometimes forgotten or not not taken into consideration in the state of the art uh, papers. You sometimes you can read that you will use uh, an RTK GPS, and that it's a good localization. But we have found out by the by the difficult way that this is not always the case. And uh, how we get now we now what the results are? How well does it work? I have uh, two examples here. The first example is uh, a short trajectory that we took with one of our robots. We start here uh, in the parking lot. We pass under the building through the passage, uh, turn around in the, in the yard and go outside. And we compare our result, which is the black line, the number of flights that we expect to see with the actual number of uh, satellites uh, recorded by the GPS antenna at the moment. It's, uh, it's slightly noisy, so we show you an uh, average value with the variance. And we compare ourselves to a simpler model, which takes into account just occlusion. We call it a binary mask only. And this is an uh, approach where you would actually just look on your point cloud and and any instance that there would be something between you and your satellite, you would just scratch the satellite from your uh, final final sum. Here, uh, close to the building, these two approaches uh, give you quite similar results. And this is because really most of the obstacles are uh, man-made hard structures. So they don't uh, let signals through. You can see it here when we pass uh, under the building, uh, back and forth. Uh, you'd be see dims in the, in the expected number of flights. When we, where we do see the difference is when we start going into the vegetation. In this experiment, the first portion is just driving on the open area, maybe around uh, the buildings. It's so this portion of, of the plot. Uh, but the difference comes when we enter the forest and we do this loop around. You can see that if you were just uh, simply masking out satellites based on the obstacles that you see around, uh, you would get much more pessimistic uh, estimate compared to the real situation. In our approach, uh, we know that in the point cloud, all those obstacles are actually vegeta vegetation. 
and therefore uh, we adjust the, the value so we get more uh, accurate expectation of the signal. Moreover, uh, we can reuse the model not to uh, look at the satellite, but to look at the expected uh, signal coverage from your static uh, RTK reference antenna. Uh, here, we compare to a simple model which takes an account just the distance, because as you get further and further from the antenna, uh, the, the signal drops. But again, when we get into the vegetation, and there are obstacles or the trees between you and your reference antenna. In this portion, you can see that uh, we can get closer estimate of the, of the signal received compared just to one that takes into just the distance. This part, we were going closer and further from the antenna, but here that's the, that's the first. And finally, when we can uh, do the, when you can project the expected number of satellites, you can do this for every point in the map for a given constellation as we wish. So this shows you that uh, you can move around with the satellites in the sky. Usually, this is, this is an example. Usually, you would just download the constellation for your given day or the time, and you would see which portions uh, have a good reception and which portions uh, are not a good idea to go to. This is a uh, slightly larger scale. You can see that the satellites are somewhere on the north part of the, of the sky view. You will get a bad reception behind the building expected. And we can do the same thing for your static uh, reference RTK antenna. You can position somewhere in the 3D point cloud map and compute what is the expected uh, radio signal strength in any part of the map. Here we see that behind the buildings you get no reception at all and maybe you want to reposition your antenna to get a better reception here compared to the case before. So I'm approaching the end. Uh, just to recap, we, in our approach, we predict the number of satellites we expect to be able to use at the given position at the given map. And we base this on a 3D point cloud map and uh, given satellite constellation that you can download from the internet or just wait for the satellite to tell you. And in our approach, we consider both uh, occlusion by big buildings and obstacles and the absorption effects caused by the environment. And the usage is, as I said, uh, use, use usage for planning uh, victories of robots, trying to get them or navigate through parts of your environment which have good GPS coverage. Or maybe to be able to, uh, when your localization deteriorates, to be able to go to a place when the reception is better and improve your localization. So that's all from my side. Thanks for the attention. And I guess I will ask Francois or, or maybe Annette to read the chat if there is something. All right. Thank you very much, Vlad, for, for your presentation. Um, is there any questions from the audience? You can use your microphone or the chat if you want. We'll wait a bit in case someone wants to show up. I might start with a icebreaker question. Why did you throw a robot into a lake? That's a very good question. Uh, it wasn't because of GPS. I guess you understand that this wasn't related to GPS. It was to see uh, if it's really as waterproof as the, as the manufacturer uh, says. And also to see what is the buoyancy and see 
for this for this our uh, budget for putting stuff on the robot if we take it into the like or we pass it in it and also to have fun come on so okay. yes all right is there any other questions i see that there's a couple of props in the audience <laughs> uh, hi i want to ask a question to vlad yes um it seems that when you did your experiment it was a sunny weather but do you think you will have the same result like during a snowstorm for example do you think your result should be accurate enough it's a really good yeah that's a good point i think this might be a weakness of what we do uh i think clouds not so much but really heavy snowstorm might uh, make it much worse because a lot of water you know that uh, the uh, signals uh, that the gps and the other systems use are around one point something gigahertz which uh, gets absorbed by water and uh, if you have water flying around you i guess uh, the signal will be much worse but you know uh if, if those things are not in your uh, map Map. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the bird. Like, yeah, you don't you cannot expect the bird. I, I think it would, would have been more reactive that you would actually detect something changed uh, around you, so you might uh, update the map. On the other hand, actually, I think it, it it might work quite well because the snow will be right flying around you, so the same distribution as as the leaves in the vegetation. Of course, the density might be slightly different, but. Yeah, might be might be done in a slightly more reactive way based on what you see. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have a question from the chat. Uh, Dominic is asking, could you use your solution um, to switch between localization solution? If, for example, you would be driving in the open road and then suddenly going off road in the wood. Uh, to switch to a more computationally expensive solution like ICP or moving on point cloud. So could could it be something that is reactive and computed real time? Definitely. Uh, uh, the quotation is not that uh, crazy. Uh, you can quickly get the, the geometry from the point cloud. Because usually uh, our maps contain uh, the knowledge that you need. So you just uh, extract the eigenvalues and get the geometry. What's slightly more uh, taking time is uh, going, selecting a point in the map and going through all the points which are relevant to you and assembling them to the uh, sky view. But uh, yeah, if you're not driving super fast and usually you have, you have some, some time, and this uh, this value is valid for some space around you. It shouldn't be it shouldn't be an, a problem. So this would be done in real time. On the other hand, uh, you are already there, so you already have your GPS antenna listening to the satellite. So you know you know what you what you are hearing. So you know how bad how bad you expect it to be. Uh, this is more for planning. So uh, the question is, should I go into the forest from the open road? And uh, like, should I start preparing myself for uh, building a map? Yeah, in that in that in that that case, yeah, that you might want to fire up some other systems sooner before you actually get into the bad situation that you don't get the GPS. All right. So the idea here is that it's it's more used for predicting the coverage more than live uh, live reading. We have a question from Amar also. Okay, hello. Hello. Uh, I have a question about the navigation here. Is it done online, or do you first like scan the environment then try to navigate on it? As, again, it's it's uh, this approach is more for prediction. So. In our experiments, we first uh, made a map and, uh, by moving the robot around, and uh, we did the prediction based on that. 
but the same thing could be could be done while you're there. Uh, and again, that's the question if or you already had the map, so you can do the, the, the planning and the computation beforehand. But if you're moving through the environment and building the map, this is the uh, this is as close as you can get these, these, these values. But usually, you know, sometimes you go through an area, you get the map uh, by looking at it, and then you can reuse it during your online uh, later yes. parts of your mission. Okay, so I was just wondering because when you take scan from the ground to the sky, the trees can, like with time or season change, they can lose the leaves, and that may change the 3D scanning. So. That's completely true. That, 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 that's, a, that's a really good point. Uh, we see it here in the campus that the, the character of the, of the point cloud changes uh, when the leaves are down, it's more, more branches. So uh, compared to the leaves, when you have more lighted the vegetation geometry in the point cloud, and it actually changes, changes the volume. So that's going nicely with the big problem in robotics, which is the long-term autonomy and long-term uh, uh, operation of robots in some environment. Yes. And then you, depends, do you have multiple maps? And uh, I guess everything can be improved, even this. So yes. you see that we do local uh, estimation of the geometry based on, based on the point cloud, but there are now ways to use uh, machine learning to recognize what's what, so you don't recognize anymore like those 10 points and say that uh, vegetation you could actually recognize that that bunch of your map is a forest and then you probably know how the tree behaves through the year so you can extrapolate on that they yes, have, okay. haven't tried that and and this is like an early stages people are no, please well i i work on place recognition and we have the same problem and I was wondering whether you can also add a camera looking like to the sky and you can train your network to recognize uh, already visited place or well, in this case would be would be just the, the trees and yeah, you can do like a cross seasonal recognition without like scanning the 3D, the, the forest in 3D. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess you could. Uh, depends depends on how uh, how well this would work in a forest because it kind of changes through the year that, that we know. Uh, mm. Just with camera, there is this issue that you have to be able to, in, at least, not for localizing for localizing, you don't need to figure out if it's a uh, if it's dense or, or or solid object. But for our purpose, then we need to tell uh, what happens to the radio. Signals coming from the satellites would need to be able to uh, classify those portions of your sky view in that uh, in that camera view, and then do some uh, thinking about is it is it a is it a building? So I don't expect the signals to get through, or is it just a piece of uh, a tree canopy? And then you you can you can use it okay. to, to pass part. Uh, the thing that you get here with the maps is that we see behind well we see behind the things if we've been there behind the things but the more complete 3D map uh, for example with the radio uh, the reference antenna it has it helps us to know what is the structure of the environment because we know that the signal needs to go through 30 40 meters of the forest with the uh, just camera image well, I was talking about combining both of them, not the, only the camera. So. One one of the, of the point here is uh, making the difference between the global representation uh, versus the local representation. If we only use the the camera, essentially point cloud, or a bit easier to extrapolate or interpolate uh, to the all ground plane as the image up there. For the camera, is always a lot uh, viewpoint dependent, uh, but you gain the advantage of all the the machine learning uh, toolkits that that can go go behind. And for the other higher level questions, 
uh, for multiple seasons. Uh, that one is harder, <laughs> even for camera. So we did early experiment by driving and measuring the noise uh, in summer under the, the tree canopy and in winter. And clearly the GPS noise is changing with seasons. Uh, now the question is whether, so in, in that work we, we deal with, you have a current representation of the environment, uh, trying to project what it would look like in summer, that one is a bit harder from, a, at least from the geometry uh, perspective. Okay. Yep, you are adding some semantics, so. Yeah. I know that there's some very cool uh, machine learning work that take an image in summer and are able to modify it uh, to make it look like in winter and, 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 and vice versa. I, I saw some of those going out. Um, it's typically more for the visual appeal. Uh, now whether we can extract the geometry out of that, that still open topics. But there, there's some, when, when Vlad was talking about multi-season localization and, and multi-season autonomy for, uh, for a robot, that's, uh, let's say, the, the latest trend in, in robotics right now. Those, those are big challenges. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Is there any other question? How are we doing with time? So, okay, we, we can still take one or two questions uh, if there is any. I will stop sharing the screen so we can each see each other. So, otherwise, thank you very much for, for your presentation. And thanks for attending. Um, and I will let Annette conclude because I have no idea. <laughs> I guess you can announce the next uh, seminar. Yeah, the next seminar will be Dominique, uh, who will be presenting. I don't have the title in front of me, but it'll be next Friday, and I will begin to announce it as of Monday. It will so, be something related to uh, a robot and, and uh, control. <laughs> So you're welcome to come back uh, next Friday for uh, another seminar from No Lab. Thank you very right. much, Vladimir. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.